Welcome back to our program on diplomatic resolutions and alternating approaches of idealism or realism in areas of conflict. Well, the so long delayed war crimes trials are finally ongoing in Cambodia. And they probably fit the model of foreign policy guided by hard nosed realism. In the 1970s, the revolutionary Khmer Rouge regime tore apart Cambodia with a savage genocide. The country is still reeling from the experience. For decades, it seemed the criminals would never be brought to justice. But the United Nations has helped to initiate the overdue war crimes trials. Only a few of the culprits face justice, but it's hoped this will offer a form of catharsis for the society. The United Nations knows the process is compromised. The hard reality is that many of the Khmer Rouge officials involved in the genocide are still in positions of influence with every intention of keeping their secrets buried. Nevertheless, the feeling is better this than nothing. However, Joe Schlesinger, who once covered the genocide as a young reporter, reflects on the pitfalls of holding the tribunal at all. Here's his report. 30 years after nearly 2 million Cambodians, a quarter of the country's population, died in its killing fields, finally an attempt to bring to justice some of the Khmer Rouge perpetrators of the genocide. But with the first of five trials, that of the commander of a prison in which 14,000 people were tortured and killed, now going on before a joint Cambodian International War Crimes Tribunal, it's become clear that the process is flawed, that it's stage managed to hide as much as to reveal. And there is indeed much to hide. For starters, there's Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen. He was originally a Khmer Rouge commander. When it looked as though he might be purged, he fled to Vietnam. He returned in 1979 with the Vietnamese, Cambodia's traditional arch enemies, who invaded the country to oust the Khmer Rouge regime. Once back, Hun Sen maneuvered his way to the top by forcing out allies he had used as a front and making up with some of his old Khmer Rouge comrades. Among them, Yang Sari, the Khmer Rouge foreign minister who was sentenced to death in 1979 by the new regime, was later granted a pardon when he defected and went on to live in luxury in Phnom Penh. That is, until now, when the government abandoned him and put him behind bars to be tried again. Until recently, Han Sen had opposed bringing Yang Sari and others before the tribunal on the grounds that, as he put it, it would only open old wounds. Some of those wounds might have been his own and that of other members of his regime tainted by their association with the Khmer Rouge. The United Nations is hardly blameless either. It continued to recognize the leftovers of the Khmer Rouge holed out in isolated pockets of the country till 1990. And so did Canada. The reason? The uh, utterly cynical balance of power uh, politics of the Cold War years. Payan Akhavan is a McGill law professor who has been involved in the Yugoslav, Rwandan, as well as Cambodian war crimes proceedings. The only question was uh, really which side of the ideological divide uh, one falls on. That meant that the West, led by the U.S., which had just had the stuffing knocked out of it in the Vietnam War, stuck with the Khmer Rouge because it objected to the presence of Vietnamese troops in Cambodia. By the logic of the Cold War, that naturally led the other superpower, the Soviet Union, to support Hun Sen. The Chinese, who at the time were daggers drawn with Moscow, in turn sided with the Khmer Rouge. The practice of treating the enemy of one's enemy as a friend didn't, of course, begin or end with the Cold War. We see the catastrophic toll which that sort of thinking uh, has had, uh, not just on Cambodia, where uh, 30, 40 years later, people still have to deal with these sort of uh, Machiavellian uh, calculations. But we see the consequences for the support of the Taliban in Afghanistan, for the support of Saddam Hussein during the Iran-Iraq war. In Cambodia's case, the UN's policy of supporting the Khmer Rouge caused great hardship because it imposed a ban on aid to most of the country. The result? Cambodians suffered. What made it worse was that the Khmer Rouge continued to wage war from their jungle hideouts 
long after they were ousted from power. Not only was, were there no moves to prosecute them, but they were actually rewarded because of their ferocity uh, uh, as a military force. With the Cold War over, the UN finally abandoned the Khmer Rouge in the early 90s and gave Cambodia a seat to the Hun Sen government. Ever since, the UN and the Cambodian government have been engaged in years of wrangling on how to bring the surviving Khmer Rouge leaders to trial. The big issue, control of the proceedings. For the Cambodian government, it was important to get the international community stamp of approval and yet avoid having the skeletons in its closet destabilize its rule. The UN, in turn, having embarrassed itself with its support of the Khmer Rouge, was eager to help build peace and bring the rule of law to Cambodia. The result, a compromise, a panel of international and Cambodian judges on which the Cambodians have a majority, giving them veto power over the proceedings. And two co-prosecutors, Chia Liang of Cambodia, and for the UN, Robert Petit of Canada. They don't exactly see eye to eye. She favored trying only five Khmer Rouge leaders. He wanted at least five more put on trial. I think you have to be able to tell as much of the story as possible, to show exactly what type of people did what type of crimes and the reasons why and the victimization that ensued. He lost the argument. She won. Many human rights advocates are skeptical about the outcome. It's not a fully international tribunal. It's a, it's a hybrid. It's a tribunal that's set up within the Cambodian judiciary, which is widely known for being very corrupt and also being subject to p political manipulation. But Professor Achavan argues that imperfect as the process may be, it is extremely important for the future of Cambodia. That trauma uh, still afflicts an entire generation. And for that reason alone, I think that even this uh, justice, which is delayed, uh, is better than no justice at all, uh, that there is some attempt at least to, to heal those wounds. But the Cambodians aren't the only ones who can learn from these trials. So can the rest of the world. The lesson? Walking with the devil, causing up to mass murderers such as the Khmer Rouge, can spread like pandemics do, and in small ways and large, infect us all. Joe Schlesinger, CBC News, Toronto. <laughs>